Right, so I'm presenting today my um, literature review. So this is the findings from my literature review, um, rather than my actual PhD study. Um, so first of all, I uh, thank you to Karen for the opportunity to present today. Um, as, as my director of studies, um, I, you know, I'm thankful of the opportunities that you've given, and, and the rest of the supervisory team as well for the, um, you know, the opportunities they've given me to present and, and, to, and to develop this work. Um, so my, my name is Michael Haslam, first of all, I'll introduce myself. So I'm a mental health nurse by background, as, as most of us are, um, and I have an interest in mental health crisis care, having worked within mental health liaison team and the crisis resolution home treatment team. And really my research interests converge with my, um, with my occupational interests as well. So I'm very interested in those uh, barriers to, and facilitators to um, mental health crisis care in particular as experienced by people with complex emotional needs. Okay. Um, we all familiar with the term complex emotional needs, yeah? Okay, for, for anybody that perhaps isn't, it's, it's pretty much, it's, uh, so we're thinking about the label of personality disorder, the diagnostic label of personality disorder, and it's considering, um, you know, those people with the diagnostic label and those people without the diagnostic label, but might have those needs that are associated with um, uh, uh, the, the diagnostic label. So I'm going to, my presentation today is, is twofold really, the purpose of it is twofold. One is to present the initial findings from my literature review, but the second thing that I want to do is to talk about meta-ethnography. Do we know what a meta-ethnography is? We all know? I'll be talking about the actual, sorry? So I'm, I'm going to be talk, well, I'm going to be talking about that through, throughout the uh, today. I'm going to be talking about how my um, how I did my metaethnography, and I suppose there's something about justifying the um, position of metaethnography at this forum, um, at, at this qualitative forum event. I'm also going to be looking because I'm, I, my PhD study is going to be looking at hermeneutic phenomenology as a methodology. So this, I want to be talking about maybe the parallels, the congruence between phenomenology and metaethnography as well. So as I said, I'm, I'm very interested in uh, crisis resolution team, uh, crisis resolution and home treatment teams. I'm quite interested in sort of why. Uh, you, you know, having worked within this team, I understand that sometimes responses to people with complex emotional needs aren't necessarily helpful. And I'm quite interested to establish why is that? What's, what's going on there? What are the potential barriers to, um, you know, to, to people having a, a positive experience? So when I started this project, what I did is I, I did an initial scoping review of um, crisis resolution home treatment, and I found that there was a lack of literature um, specifically relating to people's lived experience of home treatment teams, specifically in relation to those with complex emotional needs at least. Now there is a growing body of qualitative evidence, but I mean Dalton Locke there, it says 2021, saying there's still a firm evidence basis to be established. Um, Yes, yeah, so, so, so I thought, right, what I'll do is I'll have a look at what the um, qualitative literature, what qualitative literature is, literature is out there. And what I'm looking to do is to synthesize that qualitative literature. So I've done something called a qualitative evidence synthesis. So I've taken a qualitative evidence synthesis approach. Metaethnography is actually a systematic method of critiquing, appraising, synthesizing qualitative literature. Um, so what I did is I identified those um, those studies that talked about the lived experience of people's, uh, you know, in terms of delivering receipt of crisis care. I didn't think it was going to come up then. Um, and, and the purpose of this is to create something called third order constructs. Okay, so uh, just a brief explanation of those. First order constructs are those um, initial, the, the primary data that you would sort of gather within a primary qualitative study. So they're the participants' um, interpretation of their own personal experiences. The second order constructs is 
uh, are those that have sort of been formed um, by the original authors of the paper. So when the original authors talk about their themes, those are the second order constructs. What I'm looking to do is to develop these third order constructs. So I'm taking all of these themes, okay, and I'm considering the differences between them and considering the similarities between them. And I'm coming up, I'm hoping to generate these new understandings and these higher order theories around crisis care and how that's experienced by those people, both receiving and, um, and, and delivering care. And the difference between a meta-ethnography and other sort of systematic reviews, if you like. So if you think about sort of integrative reviews, for instance, they're quite often they're done to establish what's known about a current area. So they might be combining both qualitative and quantitative research, maybe opinion pieces. Um, and the, the idea is that they are um, uh, establishing what's going on within a particular area, practice area. The purpose of me doing this was to reinterpret those qualitative studies to identify what sort of the key issues are um, in terms of uh, people's experience of, of mental health care, of crisis care. So it's not a meta-aggregation, it is a synthesis, a qualitative evidence synthesis. And there's some congruence with phenomenological inquiry there. So I was thinking specifically hermeneutic phenomenology there's something around the interpretation, uh, reinterpretation of people's experiences. Okay, there's, um, I would say there's something about identifying people's ideographic lived experiential accounts and making sense of those, reinterpreting those. Um, you know, so you, instead of having a, one study with five participants, another with seven, you've got several studies with hundreds of participants at this point. And there's some congruence as well with mental health nursing. I, as I was sort of thinking about this, as I was thinking about sort of phenomenological inquiry um, in itself, for me, I think, well, as mental health nurses, what we do is we spend a lot of time listening to people's stories. And we try and do a lot of sense making, if you like. We're trying to make sense of people's in, uh, you know, stories. We're helping people to interpret their experiences. So there's a lot of congruence both with phenomenology and with mental health nursing. So for those of you that um, haven't heard of um, uh, uh, meta-ethnography before, there's seven stages. It goes back to the 80s, so it's almost as old as I am. Um, the seven stages between defining the focus and research question and reporting the synthesis. And you, you're following this through, you might see some um, congruence between what I would be doing here as a meta-ethnography and what other people would be doing as part of other systematic reviews, um, or in terms of qualitative studies, you know, in terms of thematic analysis and things like that. It's, it's, it's essentially you're, you're going through the same process. But the difference here is I'm taking those um, second order constructs, i.e. the themes from somebody's um, fr from the author's key themes from their papers and I'm reinterpreting those as a whole rather than just the primary data. And I'm going to take you through how I did this. So I, the first is defining the focus. Like I said, I was already looking at the area of home treatment team, crisis resolution, home treatment, and I, I had a study title in mind. This was my study title, exploring the lived experience of crisis care for individuals with complex emotional needs, experience as experienced by those giving and receiving care. And I, um, I, I made some, uh, you know, I took some um, inspiration from the PICO model there and developed some search terms based on that. So there's some representative search terms there that are looking specifically at this population, um, how care is experienced, and then the research context is within home treatment and crisis resolution. So the next thing that I did was I actually selected my studies. You can see I did a prisma diagram. So it was a, it's going down this sort of systematic way of developing um, a, a, like a, a literature review. 
and I, I even had inclusion exclusion criteria so um, it's fairly obvious isn't it we're looking at the English language if you if that's the only language you speak not speak any other languages fluently so from from a pragmatic point of view it was in, it was important to look at uh, studies that were published in the English language but also studies after 2003 and a lot of that is reflected of the fact that home treatment teams weren't set up until the early 2000s and um, Something around as well, the 2003 was the publication of some seminal documents. So for those that are aware of the documents, there's the uh, personality disorder capabilities framework, there's um, personality disorder, no longer a diagnosis of exclusion. And they represented quite significant changes in terms of the UK um, health policy towards people with complex emotional needs and the diagnostic label of personality disorder. And then I was looking specifically at qualitative research studies, so I wasn't looking for quant, I wasn't looking for mixed methods as such, unless I was able to extract primary data, qualitative data from that. I wasn't looking for opinion pieces. And I was focusing upon home-based mental health crisis care for adults, okay? Children, obviously children, um, you know, their crisis services are slightly different and the, um, there's differences there in terms of needing carers and family members involved. I was looking specifically at adults, that was my experience. And home-based mental health crisis care, because there were already studies out there looking specifically at A&E and complex emotional needs, but my focus was home-based crisis care. And then of course I needed to look at studies that would contribute to my understanding of the personal experience of users of crisis services and those clinicians that are employed by crisis services. <coughs> the next step would be quality appraisal. Now, I'm not going to go too much through this, just to let you know that I used uh, Walsh and Downs quality appraisal tool, uh, mainly because of its use um, in terms of appraising qualitative data. Um, but yeah, I won't go into any of that. There's some of the study characteristics. So you can see that um, it ranged from 2007 to just last year, 2022. Um, and you can see we've gone from sort of three or four uh, participants in some studies all the way up to sort of hundreds of participants there when we're combining that data. So... The next job that I had was to translate the studies, uh, sorry, to identify how those studies related to each other. And Noblet and Hare sort of say what we should be doing is rereading, reading and rereading the studies. Get used to them, to identify what the common, commonalities are between them, to look at the themes, to identify how the studies sort of contradicted each other. And I did a lot of that. I did a lot of that, reading, rereading, pondering. Um, but what I really, really found helpful as well, given that this is a PhD study, I thought what I'd also do is, in order to triangulate the findings, I would go back to the primary data. I'd extract that, and I'd do a line-by-line -line analysis. I'd code that, I'd categorise that, and I'd create some themes. And I'd identify um, how the themes would fit in with that from the, from the um, second-order constructs. Um, so the idea of that was to ensure rigour and because Karen knows me very well, she knows that I am more likely to, I've got these presuppositions about care, how it should be, I go off, I've got lots of different ideas. So it's to ensure that the findings that I had are grounded within the actual primary data as well, not just the, from the themes of the, um, from the initial author's themes. So the next, the next stage was translating the studies into each other. So th this was, for me, the most difficult bit. So the previous slide with all the footprints on it was about making sense of these now and being able to extract sort of data and work with that a little bit. So I, I found that I was, I was doing something initially called a reciprocal translation. And I'll just bring up what this term means. Um, so I was comparing those themes that were very similar to each other. I was comparing data that was very similar to each other. I was interested in this issue of compassion and how this is experienced within home treatment. What I found very quickly was when, it, when um, we're talking about complex emotional needs, personality disorder, 
there was lots of um, studies that refuted what other studies were saying in terms of this is how care is and people with complex emotional needs were saying this is how care should be but it isn't for us so I went down this uh, I thought about doing this refutational uh, translation uh, there was also for me differences between um, this uh, the service user accounts and clinicians accounts as well I found that the focus was different for each of the two participant groups so as a result I went down this uh, idea of doing a, a line of argument translation uh, where it has, it has created a narrative if you like around what was going on and that supported a fuller interpretation and that was where I suddenly had the emergence of all these understandings about how home treatment is experienced very differently by the two groups of participants I'll give you an example of what I did so as we can see here this is my this is a third order construct this is my theme here okay decisional um, the subcategory of that is comes down to the management of risk and the justification of risk decisions okay if you have a look there's some representative quotations here the first order constructs that have come directly from the studies that I looked at or some of the studies I looked at and there's this real uh, I've highlighted in red there this real sort of feeling that um, people were there to be managed risk was there to be managed and you can see as well how the themes the second order constructs i.e., the themes of the original authors from the original papers um, a lot of those sort of uh, were comparable as well so you can see this top one for instance comparable to this bottom one very much around decision making and how that's impacted upon by factors different factors um, that are beyond patient presentation so I felt um, you know having sort of gathered all of this data I generated this thing there's this thing that emerged around the decisional uh, and that was very very different it's in relation to home treatment So after, after sort of a lot of soul searching and pondering, I came up with these four themes, or we came up as a, as a team with these four things, these four ideas that care was experienced across these almost four domains, if you like. Um, contextual was really concerned with the wider sort of uh, crisis team exas existing as part of a wider mental health system. So that was mainly um, focused on things like crisis teams, a specialist service, the specialists in gatekeep assessments, the specialists in um, uh, managing uh, other people, managing risk. Okay, there was this idea of managing tensions there as well. So managing the expectations and anxieties of both the, um, I suppose there's something around the anxieties of the referrers. And the anxieties and the expectations of the individuals that were working with so there was there was there was a lot of that and that that sort of came out in terms of the this this how the crisis team existed as part of the wider mental health system there was a lot of managing this on the down at the other side of the scale there we've got what was important to the service users service users really valued or if they didn't receive this they wanted more of the validation they wanted reassurance, they wanted to feel cared for and supported. They wanted to be listened to and to feel like they were taken seriously. They wanted this validation. In the middle here, I, I, we'd named this functional because this was very much around the function of the crisis team on a daily basis, day-to-day -day basis. So there's something around the continuity of care and the coordination of care. That was really important to service users as well accessibility and availability the fact that we're available 24 hours a day and then timing i.e timing of visits duration of visits and and it was it was it was funny because uh, we we had these discussions within supervision sessions and we we considered how this related to phenomenology and we thought this links quite well with the existentials you know the four existentials so spatiality for instance um again the the links to the wider space within which home treatment team exists temporality there's something around timing of visits the time of visits continuity of care and um, time spent with individuals access and availability 24 hours a day relationality explains itself that links into the relational stuff 
and we really struggled with this one for a little while. I was thinking, how does the decisional domain link into sort of corporeal? Does it link into corporeality? Anyway, we we I, we I pondered on this for a little while, and we thought about it in relation to um, you know Merleau-Ponty's stuff in terms of how um, uh, you know relating to power and agency and embodiment in relation to power and agency. A lot of the stuff that was being discussed in terms of the decisional domain, so if I, if I was just to go back a little bit, hold on, was the, um, this, this, this consideration of things being done to the individual and people being sort of um, having care that was done to them and then more of a collaborative care. So there was more sort of around a personal agency there and decision making, joint decision making a shared decision making, care being in, done in conjunction with them. And so I thought that links very well into corporeality because it's something around um, uh, giving an individual uh, power and agency to make decisions versus denying somebody the personhood, not taking somebody seriously in terms of risk in particular. And uh, as I've already said, there was, um, in terms of the focus between service users and clinicians, we had a focus of clinicians up here. They were more interested in the managerial aspects of care. They were more interested in the procedural elements of care. They were more interested in ticking boxes. They were more interested in doing risk assessments to people. And service users, meanwhile, were saying, we really want more of this stuff. And some of this stuff is what prevents this stuff from happening. Yeah, so I thought, oh, great, that, that, that sort of links in very well to what I was um, thinking initially, and I was back and to and forth with supervisory team, and what do you think, is this right, am I, am I getting this right? Um, so yes, yeah, so there's this, um, there's this sort of differentiation between the two. But something that I'm working through at the minute um, that I think is really important to mention is this idea that we are, um, when we're focusing upon the contextual side of things, when we're focusing upon um, working with people, um, uh, 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 sort of the procedural elements of care rather than the relational elements of care. There's something around objectification. So I thought about, so I was talking about Anne Felton's stuff perhaps, some of the um, stuff around um, people with mental health issues, ill mental health, being treated as objects and objectification. So, so I, I very briefly, I've, I'm, I've just talk you through this but I'm still working through these ideas and I'm hoping to be able to properly I'm going to invite sort of debate in terms of these ideas afterwards I would appreciate your feedback on these but in order for somebody to be objectified they first must be treated like an object and I thought that this was happening specifically within sort of these quotations here we'll look at these representative quotations there's something around looking at the diagnosis rather than the individual there's something around just looking at the label. We're always more suspicious of people with BPD. We struggle to work with PD. They're very challenging to work with. On the other side, uh, people um, who had experienced care were saying, if you've got a diagnosis of BPD, they just ignore you. So there's something around this, treating people as a homogenous group of people and, and almost sort of uh, it's tarring them with the same brush. Very similar here, you can see the highlighted in red is um, very similar, uh, you know, for in terms of fungibility, it goes back to this idea that uh, everyone's treated the same. We treat this client group in a particular way. But I also thought there was something around viability as well, in terms of us as practitioners, how, how we feel when we're working with people. There's something around not feeling happy with supporting people with a particular diagnosis, practicing defensively firefighting, responding to immediate threats of life, and this real fear or anxiety in terms of the potential consequences when we're working with people uh, where the diagnosis of personality disorder intersects with risk issues. So I thought that, that for me really feels as if um, uh, you know, we're sort of objectifying people. When we consider um, individuals in terms of uh, risk, okay, here, for me, it's seen that the service user was being considered almost like the um, object of risk, okay? And the clinician and the resources of the, and the organization um, almost considers the object at risk. Does that make sense? So there's something around, for me, this fear of working with this client group 
because potential that was going to cause um, there were potential risks to the self or the organisation. Well, that's, I'm still working through these thoughts at the minute. For um, somebody to be uh, objectified as well, they need to be denied personhood. And there's something around this denial of um, autonomy and self-determination, which I think we can see here. If you have a look at these quotes here, we talked about these within supervision. Whilst we are... OK, no problem. Whilst we are... Um, what, what they're, they're pacifiers ultimately if you're on the phone to somebody or have you tried having a bath have you tried having a milky coffee and things like that yeah we all know those sorts of comments the ones that service users really hate okay the issue is is that people felt that they weren't being listened to and taken very seriously so there was a denial of subjectivity um, and, and self-determination and then being treated as lacking an agency as well. So going back to the slide earlier about risk management, being treated as objects to be managed, being defined by people's level of risk. Um, so that, that's, that's where my thoughts are in terms of this idea around objectification. So I think that's where I'm up to at the minute. I'm just sort of coming to the end now. So I thought I'll just make some a few recommendations, first of all, in regard to further research. And I thought that without a doubt, further research is needed in this area. What we really need is more sort of qualitative research around people's experiences of working with complex emotional needs um, and people's experience of being under the team with complex emotional needs. And linked to this, um, as well, is this, this, um, this idea of, um, you know, these factors that impact upon responses towards individuals with complex emotional needs. What impacts upon people's responses? What causes those responses? That's what I'm interested in. What's the impact of caring for people with complex emotional needs? What's the impact upon the practitioner? So it's about identifying, I, I really feel there's a lack of literature around this. And that's where my PhD study is going. It's, these are my research objectives and hopefully I'll be able to investigate that further. So last slide, I think. Um, in terms of implications for practice, there's something around um, focusing upon the embodied state, again going back to phenomenology, focusing upon the individual in crisis and focusing upon those connections and the therapeutic relationship in order to shift the practitioner, the clinician's focus from those contextual issues back towards the relational issues and that relationship. And then where there are potential power differentials within the uh, caring relationship, it's around sort of encouraging that shared sense making. So again, it be in, when we think about phenomenology, going back to this intersubjectivity and this shared collaborative sense making, this meaning making. The idea is by uh, working in a more collaborative way with people around risk issues, hopefully what we're doing is we're reducing that perception of power imbalances and those power differentials. And that's where I'm up to in terms of my study. So I'd invite any comment around anything that I've discussed there so I can sort of develop those ideas a little bit further. Thank you. I knew, I knew it would be you, go on. <laughs> Me and Michael worked together, but we didn't. We worked on the other side of yeah. the practice called Clean for Team Fence, I would say. So I think you, you were just asking about maybe further research or whatever. I just wonder whether maybe exploring the lived experience of staff who referred into the practice teams would be useful and what their views about the role of the practice team were and how they were sold. Yeah. People who maybe worked in inpatient services and then in the community, but they yeah. had to deal with the system. be a great study that wouldn't it unfortunately because it is a PhD research I've got to keep it quite tight haven't I? I've got to keep it quite focused but some of the papers that I've reviewed here actually talk about that they talk about um, uh, the people that are referring into the home treatment team and their experiences as well so um, some of the papers actually um, discuss precisely what you're saying there be great to have another study that would could explore that in more depth but like I said being a PhD project, I'm going to try and keep it as, as tight as possible. I can tell you though, Gary, that I did my master's research in 1999, 1998, as we were saying, in Preston, on the 
perceptions of crisis and mental health workers and I interviewed doctors, social workers, OT and nurses. And um, the perceptive crisis influence. I should have published it. I didn't know about publishing it in 1998. Uh, the perception of their perception of crisis was the was the strongest factor in whether or not they referred into the crisis team. Mm -hmm. And behind that in virtually all cases was their personal sense of crisis and how they were able to help the person in their state of crisis. So a crisis referral was often because the worker was in crisis as much as the person in crisis. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not sure who was first between Jim and Zoe. I think both had a number at the same time, so we're going to go. Thank you. As this is like fascinating, this is brilliant. I think it's really relevant right now, isn't it? Thank um, you. I just wondered, it's obviously what, what you're talking about, I think, you know, I don't know what he said, but seeing it, I think there was a real kind of element of um, this inner crisis team sometimes is ongoing with this assessment and not really any sort of mm. mutual intervention, just that doing two is success is success. Um, and it's something that, you know, has come up in. Um, Serious incident reviews where people either have been barred access to home treatment team because of their diagnosis, or once they're under a home treatment team, kind of just been constantly risk assessed or been discharged and said, well, it, you know, it's increasing dependence on services, so we're not going to make offer this anymore. I just wonder if you, is there anything around kind of that where things have gone wrong and any kind of, like kind of kind of serious incident reviews or anything around that? So the papers that I've looked at, like, uh, this is. So going back to the first sort of slide that I was that, that I showed you, in terms of the information that comes out for, in terms of home treatment team, I've been looking specifically at experiential accounts. I'm looking at the lived experience of of people who receive care or who deliver care. As part of that process, I was aware that there was a lot of literature around the function of the team and around what the team should be doing, outcomes, things like that. Um, I disregarded a lot of that to focus upon this stuff, but absolutely there must be stuff out there and I'm still developing these ideas and I'm still writing it up. So I'm, I'm now going back to the wider literature to see how it relates. But you're absolutely right, there should be something out there, I think. No, I think it's amazing, I think it's really, it's brilliant. Have I convinced you that meta-ethnography is, uh, <laughs> is the way to go? <laughs> I don't know if I could change right now, but... Yeah. No, 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 I appreciate it. Absolutely, no, it's fascinating, yeah. Really. I, I've got to say, having never done a meta-ethnography before, never even heard of it, complete convert now, because it feels actually like I've done a study, I've been yeah. dealing with primary data. It is, it's, it's yeah. It looks like a really good method though. Yeah. It's, it's great to immerse yourself in that much data. For, um, it really feels like, I've, I feel like I've done half a PhD already, to be fair. Um, but it's, it, no, super, it's, it, 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 it really is. It's that opportunity to sort of extract the primary data and, and do it by a line. But that's not the way that you should do a meta-ethnography. You should do a meta-ethnography by considering the themes and, and sort of considering where the themes overlap and where they refute each other. But I, I sort of did that last bit, you know, just to sort of ensure rigor and that it was a systematic way and that everything was grounded within the data. And do you know what? I'd highly recommend it. I'd do it again. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, wow. Yeah, that was really interesting. But they, I'll tell you what I was dancing around in my mind. One was um, when we publish papers with people's voices in them, mm. we often look to um, restrict or um, condense those voices so we get as much of a sense in, yeah. but without some of the wibble. Yes. So, and then I'm thinking, because that's, that's part of the art of trying to crush 10,000 mm. words into two or three, isn't it? Mm. And I think it's really important then to make sure that if we're doing that with the voices <coughs> that we gather, that we make sure that the, what we keep in is still meaningful. Mm. Always of course. With, with a bit of padding as well, because sometimes it's the context that you take out, yeah. isn't it? Mm. Yeah, because ultimately it's, it's an interpretation of an interpretation of an interpretation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've got to be careful you don't lose that voice, hence the reason why I went back to the primary data. Yeah. And, and I was so pleased that you said into subjectivity at the end because I was, that my, my reflections would be about, um, you know, into subjectivity, the value of social becoming, you know, is 
is really that there's a psychoanalytical mm. lens that you um, you're drawing upon here, but not necessarily. I'm not allowed to mention psychoanalytics, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Presuppositions, yes, yeah, yeah. I've got to, I've got to stay away from all that. An awful lot of that, um, that the language where we de not necessarily fully depersonalise, where we we split. Yes. Is um, is important to recognise. I think it's a fundamental aspect of how we work. With Absolutely. Enactment and with people's distress, how that, mm. that pushes people into enabling, pushes mm. people into their own, you know, self, 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 other distress. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, nice yeah thank you. Oh. Well, we've got time for one. Oh, sure. Yeah. This isn't very formal, sorry. It might just come out a bit uh, jargony. But um, having worked in the home treatment team, I think, yeah, really, really interesting. I don't know what you might have noticed, a lot of the modding and, and stuff. But the um, the point about um, objectifying patients, and I think it kind of links with your presentation as well. So we're having a conversation in the break about how actually sometimes the trust that I've worked for haven't necessarily lived by their own values. Yes. And I think um, the objective, yeah, ob objectifying patients in the home treatment team, whereby, in my experience, we were very much uh, sort of bound to a two-week period. Mm. And I think almost by definition, the majority of patients who you see have, are somewhere on that spectrum of having a complex emotional need, regardless of whether they've got a diagnosis of mm. whatever, almost by definition when they come into contact with those kinds mm. of services um, but in the structure I, I was just really um, for me the bit that really resonated was a bit about timing and about yes. the pressure like you've got a two-week turnaround you've got to go to a meeting to say why why this person's on your books and mm. you know and you feel like maybe because they're a human being <laughs> and mm. um, so I think sometimes those sort of structures I think there's something about the in, that kind of interpersonal mm. way of speaking about people but I think the kind of system and the organization objectifies people who come Agree. into contact with them and it's the very people who are, are already at risk of feeling rejected and that kind of so putting people into a yeah. spiral of crisis mm. and, and the actual system itself kind of mm. um, feeds into that rejection because as soon as they, they refer to you, the system makes you reject them. Abs <laughs> absolutely, yeah, yeah. So that links into some of the stuff that I did in my Masters, which was around the four-hour target uh, metrics and A&E, and actually how we don't get enough time to develop those relationships with people. And as a consequence, we're, um, we're likely to sort of focus more upon the goal, i.e. get somebody out within the four hours, than we are upon the person. And that's where a lot of this has come from. It's developed from those thoughts, those, and those initial sort of uh, discussions that I had around my Masters. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.